sa paglipas ng panahon, may mga bagay na naiiwan, tahimik at pawang walang kahulugan. Ngunit bawat bagay ay may nilalaman, may kwento, may kahulugan. Sino ang umupo dito? Nagsulat at nagsimula ng himagsikan. Ano ang mga lihim na nakatala sa kanyang liham? Ano ang kanyang naisip, naramdaman? Ang kasaysayan ay ang makahulugang pagtala ng buhay. Tulad ng karanasan, patuloy ang ating pagmulat sa tunay, sa tapat. Ngunit paano natin mababasa ang buhay na nakalipas? Ano ang kanyang kahulugan? Ito ang pangunahing tungkulin ng Pambansang Komisyong Pangkasaysayan o National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Ang kasaysayan ay unang nabubuhay sa isip ng tao at ang pagtala nito gamit ang salita ay ang bumubuo ng mga kwento ng ating bansa. Yung mga karaniwang alam na natin sa history, pag binabalikan natin dito sa research, nalalaman namin, nakakadiscover kami ng mga bagong ebidensya na nagpapatunay na yung matagal na nating alam ay mali pala kung babalikan no, yung mga especially mga primary sources. It, it makes history exciting din. May mga controversies here and there. Minsan may away. <laughs> uh, nakikita mo kung paano nakipaglaban yung mga ninuno natin. No? Kung titignan mo, lahat pala ng mga nangyari, magmula pa noon si Hermano Pule, mga Basi Revolts, lahat ito, iisa lang pala yung pinupunto nila eh. Yung pagmamahal sa bayan. Sa pamamagitan ng pagsasanin at pananaliksik, ang mga natala ay hindi na mistulang salita. Ito'y nabibigyang buhay. Upang mabuo ang kwento ng ating bansa, kailangan natin ang dalawang simpleng tanong. Ano at saan? Ano ang nangyari at saan ginanap? Sa pagtala ng mga makasaysayang lugar sa bansa, ang pirapirasong alaala ay nabibigyang kahalagahan at nagsisilbing kwentong kayamanan. Nagsimula lahat noong 1933. Sa panukalang bilang 451, binuo ang Philippine Historical Research and Markers Committee o PHRMC. Sinikap ng pamahalaan na matuklasan at makilala ang mga makasaysayang lugar bago ito mawala at makalimutan. Sa mga sumunod na dekada, lumawak ang katungkulan ng komite. Nagbago ang kanyang pangalan at nadagdagan ang kanyang tungkulin. Sabay nito ang pagbuo ng mga komisyon na inatasang ipagdiwang ang mga sentenaryo ng mga pabansang bayani. Pinag-isa ang mga komisyon sa komite at sa mga sumunod na taon na buo ang NHI o National Historical Institute. Mula rito, nabuo ang kasalukuyang NHCP sa pamamagitan ng Republic Act 10086 ng taong 2010. Kahoy at bato, marmol at bakal. Ang kasaysayan ay natutuklasan din sa mga labi ng panahon. Ano ang kanilang mga kwento? Ano ang kanilang mga lihim? Kasi yung historical items natin, paraho lang sila ng iba pang mga material things. So, pinubuo din sila ng elements at compounds, mga chemicals din sila na vulnerable to environment, na apektuhan ng, ng light, ng heat, ng humidity. Sa ating history, marami tayong mga pagkakataon na bumagsak ang, uh, ang bayan, bumagsak ang ekonomiya. Marami tayong matututunan. So, sa pamagitan din ng pag-preserve ng ating items, nagsisilbi kasi silang paalala sa atin ng ating kasaysayan na uh, magiging susi sa ating pagkakalaya sa ating mga previous na mga pagkakamali. Bilang mga pamana ng panahon, ang pagsasaayos ng mga bahay, gusalit simbahan, ay pagpapatunay sa diwa ng ating kultura. Ang mga kwento ay nabubuhay muli at siyang nasisilayan. Ang kasaysayan ay kwentong tuluyang dumadaloy, sabay sa panahon, at tuluyan ring yumayaman tulad ng pagkatao.
tungkulin ng NHCP na ipagdiwang at ihayag ang ating mga natuklasan dahil karapatan ng bawat Pilipino na makibahagi sa yaman ng ating kasaysayan. Masasabing ang pagkatao ay masusukat ng kanyang paninindigan, malilikom sa kanyang pinanigan. Ito ba'y sa tapat, makasarili ba o makabayan? Sa buhay ng bayani, nagiging malinaw ang maari nating itugon. Na ang buhay na makahulugan ay buhay na makabuluhan. Na ang pagkatao ang tunay na kayamanan. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you are all well and safe. I am Francis Moraleda from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and I will be moderating today's webinar. In commemoration of the 70th death anniversary of General Simon Ola, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Jose Inicesi Robredo, presents this webinar about the heroism of the Bicolano General and the 123rd anniversary of the Philippine-American War. Our speaker for today is specializing in the early Spanish colonial history of the Philippines. Dr. Herona did extensive postgraduate research in various archives in the Philippines and in Europe, particularly in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. He has also delivered actual lectures in prestigious gatherings of scholars such as in the Universidad de Sevilla in Spain and in the Sociedad de Geografía de Lisboa in Portugal, as well as in a number of webinars organized by various academic and cultural institutions, both in the Philippines and abroad, on various topics in the early Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. As a prolific scholar, he published monographs and books on various topics in local and national histories. The most important of these is the book Ferdinand Magellan, Armada de Maluco, and the European Discovery of the Philippines. The first fully documented work on a subject written by a Filipino historian, earning for him the recognition as one of the leading scholars on Magellan history. Professor Hirona is also the only Asian historian from among the 22 scholars from all over the world invited to write an article included in the recently published commemorative book of Spain's Ministry of Defense for the celebration of the 500 years of the circumnavigation. He is currently the director of the Partido Studies Center and the newly created Magellan Elcano Studies Center at the Partido State University in Camarines Sur. So without much ado, I now give the floor to Professor Danny Herona. Sir, good morning. Uh, good morning, Francis. Good morning, uh, Mark. Good morning, Sir Eufemio and Joanne. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, those who are uh, attending this uh, webinar uh, who wanted to learn. Uh, that's, I think, the most important purpose. But because there are others who attend seminars for other purposes which are not actually very, very good in the expansion of our knowledge, and not very, very scholarly even in, in the, the, uh, the, the purpose, because the uh, purpose of a scholar is to widen the horizon of our understanding and correct mistakes, if ever there are some. Now, my work on, um, on Ola is based mainly on my previous works on, uh, on vehicle history, because of course I spent a long time before I embark on such topic as Magellan and Augustinian history and other uh, national topics, I have spent a lot of time uh, since I was 23 years old doing research on vehicle history and publishing books on vehicle history. Now, uh, so um, let me dwell this time on Ola. Um, this is also part of a, of, a, of a book I've been working on for quite some time already. Uh, but then um, 
it was overtaken by other uh, projects, so I have to set it aside. But this time, uh, let me share some of these um, materials uh, that I would like. Original Darum, That was actually a video, these were actually video clips that I, uh, we had uh, way back in 2010. Um, that was a recorded in 2010 when I uh, went to Ginubatan, did what's working on Ola's biography, and interviewed uh, Mr. Pai. Um, at that time was uh, in 2010, he was uh, more than 80 years old. I think he was 80, 85 years old. and. Um, uh, they were neighbors of Ola. Uh, his father was a good friend of Simeon Ola. And so, uh, occasionally, Ola would come to their house, uh, have some drinks, and, um, and learn a lot of uh, stories of Ola. And the one that, that was, uh, that was uh, being related by Mr. Pai, of course, the audio is not very good. He was talking about Ola as a very, very jolly person. And he was, in fact, talking about uh, a lot of anecdotes about Ola when uh, he and his father and another friend was a priest, Father Garcira, uh, um, in way back in the uh, uh, early 1900s when they were they went over to Magarao to attend uh, the Peña Francia Fiesta in Naga and something happened. Um, I cannot sometimes I cannot. Uh, it, there are some stories I, I I'm not. Uh, it's not going to be very, very nice to tell them uh, publicly, but the main point that he was uh, saying is that Ola was a very, very jolly person. He jokes a lot, uh, and um, he's a very, very talkative guy. And in fact, he was telling us that I think there's one information that not, not most people are familiar with. Ola was cross-eyed, was so saying that, um, uh, and he was, uh, he was able to uh, deal with that. He accepted that uh, as a matter of fact. In fact, according to Mr. Pai, all I wanted others to accept him for that. Uh, so um, he was not uh, considering that as something that is uh, uh, quite uh, embarrassing to have such kind of an appearance. So that was um, all. Can you uh, now proceed? Now, the family of Ola. Okay. The origin of the Ola's name most probably came from the, the Spanish Ola. Ola could mean two things, high, and it could mean also a sea wave. 
uh, it was chosen from the 1849 uh, Claveria sa Catalogo Alphabetico de Atenienos. Uh, and we have to understand that you know, in uh, Bicol region uh, was in a way more faithful to the idea of uh, adapting a more alphabetical, uh, you might say, um, patterns uh, in terms of the, the names. For example, uh, Baao adapted letter B, uh, was adapted letter R, uh, and Ginomatan, especially uh, Albay, the towns in Albay had a more pronounced patterns in the surnames that they adapted in uh, 19, in 1849. And uh, Ginobatan had a pattern of the uh, prominent pattern of O and P. Uh, I know that because when I, I was working on the Paris records, this was after 1849, these were the family names that became very, very prominent, uh, pro very, very pronounced. Meaning to say, therefore, that uh, the town, the people uh, adapted uh, and uh, accepted the Claveria's uh, uh, catalogo, and therefore a number, many of them changed their names. Uh, we have to understand that those who were required only to adapt the names in the Claveria's catalogo were natives. Uh, the Spaniards were, accepted, of course, exempted from that. Therefore, it only tells us that, in a way, the family of Ola were actually Indians, not the Spaniards. So the, the parents' names, uh, we have Vicente de Benagracia Ola and Apolonia on the Villa Arboleda, uh, which, uh, of course, these are uh, generally available at um, uh, the Wikipedia and Google. But then I tried to check that with the Paris records, and that apparently were the exact names of, uh, of the parents of, uh, of uh, uh, Ola. His birthday, uh, September 2, 1865, in Binabatan, and he was baptized five days uh, later. Um, and uh, let me just look at that. Uh, five days later, after birth by an eminent Franciscan poet, uh, Francisco uh, Pray Bernardino de Milendreras in Ginibatan. His godfather was Mariano de Vinagracia, and uh, as the uh, middle name of his father shows, they were probably related with each other. So they were probably paternal uncle of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, Simeon Ola. Um, Ola was the second child in a family of eight, uh, of eight children. He had five brothers, uh, Regino, Dionisio, Esteban, Fernando, and Cayetano, his two sisters, Maximina and Praxilis. Unfortunately, very, very little information about this. Um, uh, and, um, um, and I was not able to actually delve deeper into these uh, questions of the family background uh, because I was planning to return after a while uh, to uh, um, do more research with uh, Mr. Pai, but then unfortunately he died uh, after a while without going over, going to this place to conduct uh, further uh, research. His wife and children. Uh, Ola's first love was a young last name, Trinidad Austria. This is actually given to us by uh, the people of uh, Ginebatan. There's, uh, there's a popular lore about the love life of Ola. And they said that, in fact, this was confirmed by by Mr. Pai that Ola was apparently a, 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 a guy who who easily falls in love with women. And uh, and um, for that reason, his, his first love was actually, he said, Trinidad, Austria, Matias. But while courting Trinidad, says that uh, Simeon also entertained romantic feelings for another woman, Brigida Stello. Both were childhood friends. Ola eventually married Brigida, but gave him no child, so he eventually married uh, Trinidad Maria uh, Matias, Austria, and bore him four children. Um, um, Trinidad was apparently also from, uh, uh, both of them were from, from Binobatan, but uh, I do not know if Bustelo uh, only migrated when they were uh, children because apparently the surname does not fit into the pattern of the, uh, the family. Uh, most generally, uh, the letter Gs were actually from source 7, so we don't really know uh, if uh, um, Brigida was from source 7 because uh, of the fact that we have to understand that by the late 19th century, Ginibatan was a gateway to uh, 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 Donsol and to other towns in, in source 7. 
Uh, in fact, the early ports at the time were one of the early ports designated where Abaca could be transported from Sorsogon and to Albay was uh, in the area somewhere in uh, in uh, Kinubata. So uh, there's a possibility that um, there was uh, tremendous migrations going on in the middle part of the 19th century and uh, probably uh, uh, the Stelo could be among those who migrated. Okay. Uh, this is an this is Ola's baptismal record. It says they're dated 7 September 1865. Uh, it says, uh, Sin Kudias, this first is uh, So I, I think that's like that. It's very, very blurry uh, and document, but it says there that he was baptized uh, five days after his birth. The five day baptism is generally the, the, uh, the, 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 the time. It's a gen uh, uh, common period among uh, infants of that time after their birth. They were generally baptized five days after. So if a child is baptized 10 days after, it's a little bit um, uh, delayed already. Uh, seldom do you find in the baptismal records, um, even earlier than the 19th century, that children are baptized a month or two months after. Uh, unlike today, we, the baptism takes place uh, sometimes years after the child is born, but not in those times. Uh, generally, the five-day period is the most uh, appropriate day for baptism. The reason is because of the fear that uh, the possibility that a child may, may die. And uh, for them, it's a big sin uh, and a big problem if the child dies unbaptized. So they make sure that a child will be baptized within that five-day period. And that was the case of Simeon uh, At 14, Simeon began his studies in the seminary of uh, uh, Nueva Castres. But then it means to say that Simeon must have already studied in their, uh, uh, in their town, uh, in the parish, probably in the uh, Escuela uh, de Niños in Guinabatan, because at that time uh, uh, the school, the, the, uh, the parishes are still operating these uh, uh, schools until around the later part of the uh, 1860s or uh, or 1880s when there were reforms introduced uh, so-called educational reforms introduced in the philippines when eventually the colonial government took over of the education of the children but definitely ola must have started his education in his hometown although uh, i could not find yet a uh, definite records uh, information on this, but there is a very, very strong possibility that uh, Ola started his education in Binibatan and then proceeded for his bachelor in Artes uh, at the uh, Seminario Conciliar de Nueva Cáceres in 1879. And the fact that Ola was able to get um, education at the seminary uh, was a proof that Ola belonged to at least a middle class. There were no, uh, I haven't encountered uh, definite um, sources or evidences that Ola could have belonged to um, a much higher social stratum uh, in the society. But most likely he was a middle class uh, family. And even his relatives, um, he had uh, aunties who were actually teachers, they were educated at the Coleo uh, de Santa Isabel in the 1860s um, and it was opened. Uh, 1868 and the Escuela Normal, um, the Maestra was actually opened in 1875 and uh, two, at least two of the uh, aunties of uh, Simeon Ola received their education at the Colegio de Santa Isabel. Uh, and at the time, generally those who received their education at Santa Isabel were belonging to at least uh, middle class and upper middle class. Uh, they Actually, they were not actually financing their education. They were shouldered by the diocese of Caceres, but um, additional expenses were shouldered by the family. And uh, at the time when you get uh, educated, either in the seminary or at the Coleo de Santa Isabel, you immediately belong to the Principalia class. Uh, that's one of the incentives that time to get educated. You immediately carry the title of Don or Doña. Uh, the moment 
uh, because uh, we always thought that the title of Don and Donya, the membership in the Principalia class, was generally thought to have been derived uh, by public service, meaning to say if you were elected uh, as members of the, uh, the colonial bureaucracy, you get that, uh, that, 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 that title, but that's not actually true. Uh, if you get educated, then you belong to this uh, Principalia class. Okay. His grades in Latin, the only subject whose records uh, were intact in the seminary, seemed to indicate Ola was an average student. And most of his grades were actually uh, from a bit shadow or satisfactory in some way. Uh, and um, in 1881, Ola gave up his studies after reaching first year in uh, philosophy. I mentioned this because uh, the common impressions, even in the internet, the, there's certain internet uh, information that says that Ola uh, left the schooling at the age of 31. It says because he left uh, in 1896 in the wake of the revolution. That is an assumption. And that's, I, I think that's, that's the reason why it's, um, it's not, uh, we have to, uh, a historian has to, of course, consult more openly the archival records. Uh, the archival records seem to indicate that Ola uh, was uh, out of, the, of, of uh, the seminary in 1881 because uh, his names do not appear anymore in the records and even in um, the works undertaken by during my time as a faculty of the um, of the seminary of Nova Caceres, my 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 the students uh, my, my handling in legal history uh, way back in the um, late 1990s uh, had undertaken a project to document to, to create a list of all the graduates of the of the of uh, those who studied in uh, disappeared from the record in 1881. So we assume uh, with very, very strong uh, possibility that Ola left the seminary in 1881. And therefore, he only, uh, only stayed for from 1879, um, his full year 1878, 1879, 1879 to 1880, 1880 to 1881. Uh, he only stayed for three years. And I think um, that is generally the, the, the pattern. Uh, I think three years. We don't. They don't really spend. I think, in, from my memory, I may be wrong, but from my memory, they don't really spend uh, until four years. So I think three years generally would be their completion of the uh, of their uh, bachelor in artists. But as I said I may be wrong. I, I do not have exact. Uh, I might have. Uh, I might have forgotten some of details and stuff. Anyway, but by 1881, Ola left the, the seminar after his. Um, departure from the seminary, uh, we don't really know what happened to him. But uh, oral accounts and some researchers of the town claim that Ola became a member of the, he, was, he became a teniente of the rural police called the uh, quadrilleros. So because apparently of his education, Ola uh, um, landed in the uh, municipal bureaucracy as a policeman, um, but the, uh, not a guardia civil, but a quadrillero. Uh, in the hierarchy of the uh, peace officers at the time, the quadrillero belongs to the lowest level because it's generally a municipal police force. The, uh, you have to understand that the guardia civil is just like the Philippine Constabulary. Uh, it has a na national scope uh, or the national police rate as a uh, the jurisdiction has, uh, is nationwide in some way. And uh, Ola did not join that or probably did not, uh, was not, did not qualify because at the time, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a prestige for a person to get accepted in the uh, Guardia Civil Force. And here's the, the record, uh, again, another evidence that Ola started uh, his education uh, in 18, the school year 1878-1879 and there, it, uh, the shaded part shows there of uh, Simeon Ola. Then the revolution broke out and again there were some uh, sort of a myths about Ola and about the region. Like for example, the belief that 
there was a Katipunan unit in Camarines Sur, in Albay, and in, even in Sorsoran. Well, uh, I, I was also made to believe in that uh, when I was working way back in 1984-85 on my was a young, boy, a young man then, I really graduated in college for pursuing my master's at the Ateneo de Manila. And I have time to do research in the archives and uh, was working initially on uh, my on a um, Bicol history book, which of course I would acknowledge there are, there are certain uh, limitations because of my not being trained at that time, a historian. But then the point is, there were some documents then which I have not critically evaluated and I was also made to believe that there was a Katipunan in the Bicol region in 1896. And uh, in Albay, a prominent, uh, a certain prominent name, uh, Glyceri de Lugado, would come out uh, almost all in, uh, in their history as the one who started the, uh, the, the recruitment for the Katipunan. But apparently, uh, there were no basis for that. The source of information of that was eventually debunked by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines as being spurious. And therefore, uh, we probably have to re-examine the belief that a Katibunan unit existed in 1896 in Camarines and Albay. And um, it is said that uh, uh, Ola was among those recruited by the Sirio Delgado. But we don't really have any direct evidence on this, but most likely it is a myth. But Ola uh, eventually joined the uh, revolutionary forces in the later part, it's probably after uh, in the 89, 1898 um, outbreak of the revolution here in, in Bicol, especially beginning with the revolution in September of 1898 in Nueva Casa, which eventually spread uh, in the rest of the to the rest of the Bicol region uh, as well as Albay. So, but the point is, of course, in the later part in the 1898, Ola definitely uh, must have uh, must have joined. The, uh, these revolutionary forces. But uh, the, the most uh, evident uh, participation of Ola was in the Philippine-American War. There was no question about that, that Ola uh, served as among the officers of General Vito Villarmino uh, during the Philippine-American War. In fact, uh, he carried the rank of a captain, then later on promoted to the rank of a major. Uh, here's uh, General Dito Villarmino, and here's uh, Jose Ignacio Pava. By the way, Villarmino was not, uh, although there were a lot of the Bicolanos who carried the surname of uh, Villarmino, Villarmino was not actually a Bicolano. He was from Cavite. He was a Mason. He was uh, uh, designated by Aguinaldo uh, in the wake of the triumph of the, um, of the, um, of the revolution in the Bicol region. And so... Um, uh, in preparation for a possible outbreak of the Philippine-American War, uh, a militia was actually uh, organized and Villarmino uh, was uh, the overall commander of the Albay and the Bicol, uh, uh, Albay, uh, Camarines had a different uh, military unit uh, led by Gibara and other, uh, and Peña and other military officers, also not the Colans, they were also mostly Tabitinists just like um, Villarmino. There is another guy, Jose Ignacio Pawa, uh, and uh, eventually the two would eventually lock themselves up in some quarrel. And uh, because of sort of a military competition in some way, and uh, Pawa was uh, accused of insubordination and certain uh, act of corruption uh, when he, uh, he got hold of certain amount of money and he did not remit them to the uh, again, and the government. So, but then they too played a key role in the history of the Philippine American War in Albay, and Ola was involved in, in these uh, activities. Mm. Uh, but then eventually, Pawa would have a major role in Ola's uh, continuing and the continuance of the resistance of Ola uh, for certain reasons, which I will. Uh, mentioned uh, later. So uh, on July 4th, 1901, Ola surrendered. And it says here uh, from the report of uh, Lieutenant Higgins to Colonel Harry Bandholz that Ola surrendered because uh, he surrendered together with uh, with uh, Vito Villarmino, a 
apparently was enticed to surrender because Bilarmino was decided already to surrender because he was getting blind. That's one of the reasons of Bilarmino that uh, apparently um, uh, they were losing the, the war and also Bilarmino was losing his sight. And so he decided to surrender and with him came um, um, Simeon Ola. I think the date July 4th is significant. Uh, America was celebrating its, uh, uh, its independence, its time, and um, America must have offered certain kind of incentives to highlight the celebration of their independence. And for this reason, uh, uh, Ola and Villarmino must have received certain concessions and therefore took advantage of this to surrender on that uh, July 4th event. And, and so it says, Abicol, native of Ginobatan, ex-major of insurgents, and who surrendered at Legaspi in July 4th and returned to Hills as chief bandit soon after. So that was uh, an important phrase there. After a while, Ola returned to the hills. But why? There were uh, uh, a number of American historians, contemporaneous, they were writing in the early 1900s, for example, Parker Willis, would say that in a lie, one cause of the practical insurrection, which resulted in the tremendous reconcentration operation of 1903, was the oppression of those who had risen to the higher offices in the towns. Even in the first report after the inauguration of local government, the commission complained of what was termed as caciquism, a kind of bozism, or as the commission phrased it, a tendency to exercise arbitrary powers which had not been conferred by law. And that was, of course, um, generally widespread in the early part of the 1900s. This so-called, uh, this, this idea of fixation uh, to, uh, to power, because by the later part of the Spanish era, remember that many Filipinos, of course, the Polanos, were allowed uh, certain positions, but generally uh, from the beginning of the Spanish regime until the end of the Spanish regime, the, the their powers only confined to the uh, to the position of a governor uh, uh, yeah so uh, uh, and in fact earlier on the, the Filipinos would like to carry the title of governor but the Spaniards tried to in a way try to emphasize to the Philippines that the title of a governor is not appropriate for you you are you are smaller than that so they adopted this uh, diminutive feature by putting a silio. So a governor becomes a small governor, and that has been that stuck in our Philippine uh, political history that the Filipinos were smaller in terms of power, and they were only allowed to occupy a position of a governor, a governor which is smaller. And for that reason, um, there was a certain kind of a longing for uh, power. And during the American era, when there was a certain kind of um, uh, a certain uh, liberty given on to the Filipinos, the Filipinos eventually exercised their power even beyond the limits uh, allowed by law for them. So they become, as, 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 a, um, as a part of Willis would say, this phenomenon of caciquism. And among those persons apparently exercised that or felt that kind of, a, uh, of arrogating power for himself uh, was a certain Cirilo Haushan. Haoshan was a mestizo Chinese, and most probably Haoshan, I think Norman Owen mentioned of this, came from uh, Iloilo. Most of the uh, prominent businessmen in Albay at the time were actually from Molo. In fact, if you uh, was working on the eruption of Mayon from the Archivo Franciscano Ibero Oriental, the 1814 eruption, and the Franciscan archives in Madrid, the Afio, uh, I was surprised to see that a lot of residents of Kagsawa at the time when it was destroyed by the 1814 Russian were actually from Molo. Not, not, not in my domain, but an, a large number of the population were from Iloilo. They were traders and some of them were probably transient, uh, moving from Molo to Kagsawa, Kagsawa to Molo. And uh, that and among those probably who migrated to uh, Bicol at the time were the Haushan family. And um, Haoshan eventually became very, very wealthy. And uh, so by 1898, in fact, uh, I think as a concession by the revolutionary government, because 
uh, how Shan must have supported a lot of uh, resources to the uh, revolutionary government. Uh, he was uh, eventually elected as a, a governor of uh, And But then, uh, something went wrong. And the, the second, uh, this uh, um, statement of Dean Worcester would say, to quote him, smarting under the indignities which he had suffered, how Shan made it very uncomfortable for the former major and in ways well understood in Malay countries brought it home to the latter that their positions had been reversed. Ola's house was mysteriously burned and his life in Ginebatan was made so unbearable that he took to the hills. Now, this is the reason why Ola resumed his resistance. It is said that Cyrilo Haushan persecuted Ola. And according to Worcester here, he, Ola's house was mysteriously burned. And the suspicion was it was Haushan who was responsible for this as a vengeance for what he thought was actually the wrongdoing of Ola to him and to his property. The story is that um, Cyrilo Haushan blamed Ola for the burning of his house and his uh, warehouse um, during the advance of the American forces in Ginubatan. But in reality, and a number of records say that the one who resorted to this was not actually Ola because Ola was a native of Ginubatan. He wanted to protect Ginubatan as much as possible, avoid Ginubatan from being engrossed in this, uh, uh, in, uh, being, uh, the residents of Ginubatan from being, uh, in, uh, being locked up in this, uh, crossfire between the Americans and his forces. And that then there is, it was power who decided that the best way to prevent the Americans from entering and occupying Ginebatan is was by resorting to incendiary strategy, when you say by burning the town of Ginebatan. And for that reason, it was blamed to Ola by Cyril Haoshan. And quite interesting because on us uh, interviewing Mr. Uh, Pai was saying that Cyrilu Haoshan and Pawa were actually good friends when they were uh, young young men, young boys and young men at the time. But then apparently somewhere along the way they drifted apart because of um, the wealth of uh, Cyrilu Haoshan, this uh, uh, commercial interest and political interest of Haoshan. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the reason why eventually Ola had to go to the hills. So here is uh, Cyrilu Haoshan. Uh, uh, I think that someone uh, from the family posted this uh, this uh, uh, picture of the uh, civil house. A wealthy resident in Ginovato was circulated all of blaming him for destruction of his properties. Ola was widely believed to possess an antinative. When he was uh, when he resumed his resistance, uh, went to the hills. All I remember was a former officer, and for that reason, he still had a number of large following up in the hills who were recalcitrant. You mean, meaning to say these were actually people who were not killed, despite the fact that a lot of the officers had already surrendered. Uh, among them, Lazaro Toledo, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the list, I have a list about all these uh, major officers of Ola, and they were still uh, entrenched in the hills of Ginobatan and in some, in, in some parts of the of Albay. So he, Ola, par apparently was confident that he can count on these uh, former officers that he had who are still in the hills. And so he, um, he continued his battle in the hills of Ginobatan with his former officers whom he trusted so much. But why is it that people apparently uh, had so much respect on Ola? And this was confirmed also by Mr. Pahe and some of the people there. Uh, there was one, a, there was a researcher, I forgot his name, who wrote, in fact, an early book on Ola as part of his thesis, uh, Mr. Palacio, who also had been talking about this uh, belief that Ola uh, was a possessor of Anting Anting. And this was apparently one of the reasons why uh, Ola commanded respect on the people of Ginebata because uh, Ola was believed to be a possessor of an antique thing. I think that was a popular belief at the time that any officer uh, in the uh, in the revolution in the army generally possessed 
and thing and thing. And that belief uh, was passed on even during the guerrilla era. If you interview people um, and look at, uh, do some research on the guerrilla officers, most of them were held to possess and thing and thing. And so that, that their fame of being brave and being invulnerable apparently was eventually used as a propaganda to rally to their cause the, the people who were still uh, suspicious or unbelieving in their capacity to dislodge the Japanese during the war. Um, but that, that was also true during the time of Ola. And Ola was believed to possess anting and thing. And surprisingly, Ola seemed to believe also in the power of anting and thing. There was a certain uh, anecdote, I think it was Baden Holtz who wrote uh, this, uh, and mentioned about when Ola was arrested, Ola was supposed to be carrying something. And Ola, when he was asked by Baden Holtz, he said, what was that? And Ola said, this is my anting and thing. Uh, and I said, why? Because when the Americans were coming, it moves. Something inside this was actually moving. And apparently telling me that I have to escape because the Americans were coming. And uh, Van Holtz was curious. He said, what's that? And he showed uh, this uh, object to, uh, to uh, Van Holtz. And Van Holtz, in a way, laughed for himself because he was actually carrying an electric bulb. And probably at the time, all of us not familiar with that electric bulb. We don't really know, but then, uh, and it was, uh, the one that was moving was actually the filament inside the bulb. And so, Van Holt says, oh, uh, it moves because you are nervous. Whenever you hear that Americans are coming, so your handshake, so that thing moves. It's not because of the other way around that uh, you know that the Americans are coming because it, uh, the movement of the filament. But the filament moves because you heard that the Americans were coming. So the, I do not know how to do but this is uh, one of the uh, anecdotes mentioned by Van Holtz in his memoir. The other thing is that Ola enjoyed the support of ordinary people of Ginevana and the nearby municipalities. There's no question about that. Uh, the Americans were surprised that whenever they come uh, in search of Ola, uh, Ola would be informed ahead of time of the people so he could immediately escape and uh, and uh, they could enter uh, in the municipality without no, the Americans knowing them. So the, there was strong suspicion among the American officers that Ola enjoyed wide support from the ordinary people. And just like what happened, the so -called, uh, uh, there is a certain kind of a uh, relay system um, that, uh, very, that was very, very uh, widely used in the Philippine-American War, including, of course, uh, Ludovico Arejola's forces still in Camarillo Sur. See, this, uh, uh, the passing of information from one, one person to the other without the Americans knowing it, they insert the, and sometimes not only by, by actual uh, uh, sending of messages by words, but by written materials. They send it in, they put it in their bakya or they put it um, they small, in small pieces of the paper, and, but the point is, Ola enjoyed white support from the people, ordinary people. But what about the wealthy people? Uh, Ola definitely enjoyed also from merchants. But that's quite unusual. Here is a rebel. You might, con might consider him as a troublemaker on the part of the merchants who were enjoying their life. Uh, and here comes Ola sustaining the, 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 the trouble still it is in Albay, even way after most of the officers have already surrendered. Well, there was an American uh, historian during that time who suspected and blamed the merchants for prolonging the, uh, the agony of the people of Albay because of the Ola insurrection. And he says that the merchants had their own agenda why they supported Ola. And quite unusual, the reason is this, because the merchants wanted to prolong the war in order that the farmers would no longer plant would no longer harvest, and therefore their lands would become useless. And if their lands would become useless, then they would sell them to the merchants. Why? For Abaka. We have to understand that Abaka requires white acreages of land, and therefore it is essential for them to have vast tracts of land being sold collectively by these farmers. And the only way to discourage these farmers from planting more 
and therefore making use of this of their lands was to prolong the war the, the more they the more the war uh, extends the more they will become hungry and therefore they will be forced to to sell them and the ones who would be buying them would be the merchants who would be waiting until the war would end and therefore transform them into abakala and that is the reason why the merchants eventually supported Ola. But eventually, the merchants also gave up their support for Ola. The reason is because once peace had already settled in most parts of the Bacal region, and therefore the investments for Abaca was waiting for them. And as Americans were again resuming their uh, trade, it became a burden for them to continue the war. And therefore, they supported the American government to stop Ola from continuing the resistance by their fundings. And that's uh, the reason why apparently Ola enjoyed wide support during his time. But eventually, uh, the merchants who had no other vested interest other than profit and had no nationalist interest, they simply were making use of Ola for their, for their own agenda. Arlington Bates was the first American governor of Albay at the time, and he was the governor. Uh, in 1902 at the height of the Ola insurrection. And Arlington Betts eventually was among those who worked for the surrender of all peace in Albay. The final surrender of Ola. On September 25, 1903, I accompanied them. This is the brief narrative by Lieutenant Page Low and Pyle, Sitio Malangatong, Napakuginubatan, Albay. Ola surrendered to Arlington Best, the one I showed you earlier, and to Colonel Harry Bandos. With him were 29 um, firearms. Ramon Santos, a David contained, at past half three, I entered the town of Ginobatan with Ola and his band of 50 to 60 men with uh, about 30 guns. He surrendered to Colonel Bandos in front of the presidencia. By the way, prior to that, there were various attempts of the, milit of the American military officers to persuade Ola to surrender. Well, the reason is Ola was already a national figure. Not, not only from national, but international figure, especially, especially in the American media, because they were already carrying news of the difficulties encountered by the American forces in the Philippines because of the Ola insurrection. In fact, the Americans, the uh, Philippine scouts and the uh, Philippine constabulary were forced to uh, pull out from, uh, from Mindanao a large number of their troops just that they have to uh, concentrate their forces in the surrender of Ola in Albay, but they failed. And so a number of major officers, like for example, uh, Baker, and I, and I think I forget the first name, Baker is an, an important officer in the uh, constabulary, and uh, Aba, Aba Gies Garwood, Garwood was, I think, the vice, uh, the assistant uh, chief, uh, uh, vice chief of the Philippine constabulary in during the time of the Ola insurrection, and uh, Ola offered him, uh, invited him to come to his uh, to his camp. Of course, uh, Garwood took it uh, uh, as an opportunity because uh, Ola was already, as I said, a national figure, and therefore anybody who could surrender could uh, persuade Ola to surrender would become a hero in the eyes of the Americans because of, uh, um, they would suppress the, this uh, this trouble in Albaya and uh, it's affecting already the American economy in the Philippines. Uh, because of the uh, Abaca trade. And for this reason, he willingly came to the camp of Ola and talked to Ola. And there was a certain description there. Uh, I, I think one of the American officers that uh, it, was a, they were, that it was a jolly mood between Ola and uh, Garwood, it was a handsome uh, uh, military officer. And uh, apparently, Garwood was very, very much uh, um, uh, jubilant with the invitation because for him, uh, he will bring the bacon, so to speak, uh, if Ola surrenders. But then he paid. Uh, Ola did not surrender in the terms given by uh, Jessica Wood. But then some historians, in fact, Americans uh, were blaming Garwood for falling into the trap of Ola because they thought that it was actually Ola's trap for Garwood. Now, Ola was making use of the meeting to aggrandize his position as a military officer. It became a sort of a propaganda for the um, for his war. It seemed to be telling, see, look at this American officer. He was a 
uh, second highest ranking officer in the constabulary who would come to my to my camp and ask me to surrender. So it became, uh, it in a way, increased the military prestige of Ola uh, for this reason. Um, and uh, so the war continued until, of course, in September 3, um, when Ola eventually surrendered. But the surrender of Ola, as uh, the report of Banol says, the surrender of Ola was um, practically the end of Ladronism in Albay province, as by example, influenced the other leaders all came within a month and gave themselves up with the soldiers and arms. Palermo surrendered to Tito Sacolo. This war, by the way, uh, the uh, officers of Ola, even when he was still in the uh, in his town after the surrender in 1901, his, his men continued the resistance in the hills. Uh, Sacolo, Palermo, um, Toledo, um, Raquel, they were actually there and therefore Ola, as I said, uh, had a very, very efficient military field commanders uh, in, this, in, 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 the, in this war. And so, um, this, so Ola eventually surrendered. But then, there were some controversies in the surrender of Ola. For one, some of the American authors or historians at the time, or probably even uh, bureaucrats, uh, were saying that apparently Bandholz was not able to persuade Ola to surrender simply because of his, the overwhelming force of the American forces. Uh, nor because of uh, Ola's respect for Bandholz being, I think he was the chief at the time of the Philippine Constabulary. But Ola uh, surrendered because of certain concessions made by Ola. And uh, I think it's Willis Parker who presented certain informations on this. And uh, one of the information he mentioned is that Ola was giving certain kind of uh, conditions for the surrender. One is that uh, Ramon Santos would be made a governor of Anbay and his uh, relative, um, 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 uh, for that the, the discerning of this relative of Ola, uh, I think he was uh, Arbuleda, um, would be made mayor of Ginebaca. So these were some of the uh, concessions. And of course, Ola would be given some kind of a pardon. He would be given an amnesty if he surrenders. And uh, some of these uh, Americans didn't like it. You said, hey, imagine you descend, you go down to the level of this uh, drone, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, bandit, and offered him all these uh, concessions that you can. Uh, that only shows one thing, the weakness of the military forces of America. And it's embarrassing that you go to that, that level to this guy who is a virtually a nobody and a troublemaker. So it was not well received by some of the uh, American bureaucrats. But just the same, Ola eventually surrendered. And this is the end of the uh, Ola insurrection in Albay. But it became a textbook knowledge that Ola became the last Filipino general to surrender. Earlier on, there was, of course, there's a rec the recognition went to a general, uh, in the, um, General Miguel Malbar, uh, Batangas, and that he was the one who surrendered last. As uh, not only did the one to surrender last, but he was surrendering with the rank of a general. But some historians, um, Filipino historians, I think Chilidong and Cheta among them, doubted his claim. Uh, one is because they said that Ola already surrendered in 1901. And uh, so with that, that was the end of his career. But then when he went back to the hills, uh, it's a different story. Because when Ola fought in the Philippine-American War, it was out of this patriotic, you might say, uh, impulse. It was out of his love for country and was fighting there. But when he went back to the hills, some term, some, sometime in 1902, it was already driven by a different motive. Say probably vengeance because of his indignities, uh, difficulties he went to um, from Sri uh, Luhaushan. So it was more of a personal motive. Right? 
And the argument also raised because he was not carrying the rank even in 1901, and it's of course the first time he surrendered, he was not carrying the rank of a general, he was carrying the rank only of a major. So the resumption of the war at that time was not, of course, I would say, very, very nationalistic in purpose, but more about personal, and that's the question that in some way. Also, more of the perspective of the American. Ola does not deserve, according to some Americans, deserve certain kind of concessions and even the privileges that should accrue to the regular forces of the Aguinaldo government because Ola surrendered beyond the deadline given during the so-called when the when the so-called Brigandage, Brigandage Act was passed on November 12, 1902, which says that all revolutionary officers should surrender, if my memory serves me right, uh, within that particular time frame. Uh, they gave a certain deadline. And anybody who surrendered beyond that would no longer be treated as a um, military officer of the legitimate uh, enemy of the American government, the Aguinaldo government, but would be treated already as a bandit. And that's uh, so-called... Uh, so that's the idea that that's the substance of the brigand they chat. He was to be treated as a brigand, no longer as a gentleman and an officer of a legitimate uh, enemy of another state, that of America. And of course, as you see, I think um, I just forgot the exact date of the deadline, but it's, uh, it says that, but I think it's just simply on uh, 1902, and or even but definitely not beyond. Uh, 1903, uh, September at the time when Ola surrendered. So the argument of the Americans is Ola does not deserve any concession as an officer of the army, uh, of a legitimate uh, enemy government, um, nor even an amnesty because he was already acting as a, uh, as a bandit. He was no longer classified by Washington by the American forces in the Philippines as one who was fighting a just cause. Um, and so he was uh, not, of course, recognized for that. Um, just uh, to give you a picture of Jess Garwood, um, uh, was uh, the one I was mentioning to you that tried to persuade uh, Ola to surrender, even going to the camp of Ola. But, of course, Garwood failed to, uh, to persuade all. This is the picture of uh, Harry Van Holtz, of course, um, general available in the internet, but um, I took this from an early 1900 uh, book. Assistant Chief of the Constabulary, Fred did the Ola surrender. So basically, well, we have to understand also that uh, in some other um, uh, notes on these officers, uh, Van Holtz was uh, notorious for being producing in a way. Uh, ah, sorry, uh, it was uh, Garwood was notorious for resorting to certain kind about tortures. You know, more, I would say, uh, at least the description is was in a way uh, capable of using um, uh, very very hard methods to persuade officers uh, to surrender or to to give up certain informations. And uh, Van Holtz, I think, was, uh, 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 if my memory serves me right, was uh, very, very famous for being, uh, for establishing a kind of a, um, an efficient uh, intelligence system, spy network, uh, during the American, with the American Revolution. And, uh, of course, uh, during, sorry, during the, the Philippine insurrection. And in fact, uh, would even go to uh, resort to the concentration. Uh, uh, and people were required to go inside the town, prohibited to work in the farm, and therefore depriving them of their uh, livelihood. So that's it. And this is the uh, uh, picture. The, the last guy uh, in the, on the right side was uh, Judge Carson. Carson, uh, ah, sorry, uh, just, Justice Carson and uh, Justice Trent, sorry. Uh, Trent and Car Carson actually were earlier assigned in Albay, and uh, interestingly, uh, Carson was among those who sat 
uh, during the judgment of Ola. And at uh, one time when he was uh, was an anecdote of Bandholz, when Ola was being introduced to Carson, uh, he said, oh, I was about to shake his hands. But when he shared the name Ola, he said, oh, I cannot shake my hands to someone. I am going to hang uh, a few days after. So um, the idea is uh, they uh, considered Ola in a way as a, as a criminal. But then uh, Ola was pardoned. Uh, and it is uh, for this reason that Ola was pardoned and a number of his, um, the, it says there are about 500 of these troopers, uh, these uh, uh, members of this uh, movement uh, who were actually tried, but a number of them were immediately uh, released and exculpated from the crime. But some of them, um, several hundreds more, uh, were incarcerated and a number were actually hanged. But Ola was paid, and this became another source of controversy among the historians at the time. What did Ola do? Because he was supposed to be the leader and was supposed to be the, the most guilty, and yet he was paid, and all these other troopers were actually uh, the more of a, a, a ranking personnel, were the ones who carried the burden of the pill. But of course, uh, this is a different story. There, uh, if you go to the narratives of the war, there are actually a lot of crimes committed by ordinary rank and file, not necessarily by the uh, the officers. Uh, and uh, if you will notice around 1902, 1903, a number of trials, number of investigations were conducted, and many of those who committed the atrocities against the Americans and against the Filipinos were not actually the top-ranking officers, but most of them were those in the field directly engaged in the battle and uh, de therefore dealing with the people. Uh, and so that's probably the reason why uh, uh, many of them were actually the ordinary uh, uh, soldiers of Ola's uh, forces were were executed. So uh, basically that's it. But definitely one thing we know is uh, Ola died in February 14, uh, was celebrated today in the 75th year not celebrate, but of course we commemorate, uh, we remember him on his 70th year of his, uh, of his uh, death. Um, uh, he died at the age of 86. Uh, and as I said, the, Mr. Pai was uh, telling us a lot of uh, stories when Ola was around 60 years old and he was a young boy then. And you heard a lot. Of course, uh, Ola lived until the 1950s. And so Mr. Pai was there. I was already uh, matured. Uh, and Ola was, uh, when Ola was, uh, when Ola died, somewhere, the, uh, that Ola occupied, before his death, occupied an important position in Kinabata, and I think he at one time became mayor, so he must be a very, very prominent guy, uh, even after his, uh, his uh, pain, uh, uh, heroism during the 1900s. And, but one thing is sure, I can, that I cannot doubt that, uh, all of us are true here, in, regardless of the reasons why he resumed his battle. Uh, the reason is because anybody who had been to the hills at Ginobatan, and I've been there, uh, but I wasn't able to visit the cave where Ola spent, uh, because we were discouraged to proceed there for, for uh, safety reasons. You would, we went there in 2010, so it's much, much uh, recent times. But imagine, it's a difficult journey. Uh, the place was still very, very isolated and virtually inaccessible. And for a man who stayed there, continued the battle, definitely the purpose is certainly beyond simply personal. There must be something in him that urges him to continue and sacrifice the safety, the convenience of a home, in a quiet town, in a prosperous town at Binubatan in the early American period, and continued the resistance up in the hills. Something deep must have been in the heart of Ola for continuing the resistance. It's not probably Haushan, it's not probably vengeance, but something still, the fire of nationalism, still burns in Ola's heart. And that's probably the reason why Ola continued the war until 1903. Thank you very much.
Hello, ma marami na aga po sa Tuyo Gabus. Good morning po, sir. Pero okay. nadadadangon po ako, naririnig okay, po ba? Okay po. Thank so, thank you so much, sir, for that insightful lecture. And we will now accept question for our speaker. So, uh, the Museo ni Jesse Robredo is uh, live in our Facebook page and the other Museum of National Historical Commission of the Philippines. While we are accumulating po some question, um, mga pagbati lamang po sa ating mga manunood sa iba-ibang panig na lugar sa Pilipinas. Especially ang ating mga kaguruan, sila po ay talagang nanunood at nag-aabang ng ating mga webinar. Good morning everyone watching from Mataas na Paaralan, Juan C. Laya, SDO Pangasinan, si Mr. Alvin Padua. Isang pagbati na naman po galing Davao City. Wilma Fortenes Mugas, good morning po sir, watching from Diego Silang Elementary School, Matina District, na Davao City. Ayan. So babalikan po natin ang mga pagbati ng ating mga kaguruan at mga estudyante na nanonood ngayong umaga. So ito pong uh, question na ito ay galing po sa isang um, anonymous. So the question is, uh, sir, why did... Uh, Simeon Ola become a hero while he was just hiding. Well, of course, we have to understand that Ola was not just hiding. He was engaged in a lot of raids and attacks in various towns. And that's in, in some way paralyzed and embarrassed mm -hmm. the American forces in, in Albay. And that's precisely the reason why even the top-ranking officers of the Constabulary and the Philippine scouts were even compelled to in a way, beg Ola to, to surrender and allowed to, uh, and even uh, uh, gave Ola enormous uh, uh, liberates and concessions just for him to surrender. So it was a big trouble for the Americans. In fact, it was a big headache for the Americans, especially the pressure was, of course, coming not only from the American government, but from the American investors because it terribly, um, in a way, uh, uh, create a lot of difficulties in the business uh, in Albay. We have to understand that from 1865 to 1925, Albay was um, was among the richest towns and the major supplier, not not a town, by the province in the Philippines, and because of the abaca trade. And uh, the Americans were very, very, of course, uh, very, very interested in this lucrative trade because of the tremendous value of abaca for shipping and for other purposes, even clothing. And because of the trouble that uh, Ola was uh, creating as continuing because of his insurrection, the American investors were already angry at the American forces and say, oh, what, what are you doing? You cannot stop this guy from, from uh, continuing his resistance. So in a way, it's an embarrassment for America. So in that particular respect, only, only uh, Ola becomes a rallying point of Filipino pride. Here is a guy, an ordinary guy who could embarrass America and with all the superior forces, with all the training. That's something already for us. Ola was not only hiding, he was engaged in war, he was attacking, he was uh, embarrassing the Americans in that respect. Okay, thank you, sir. So that would be a um, magandang paliwanag kasi marami pong naguguluhan. Alam naman natin na may iba-iba tayo ano po, opinion from it. So, nagkaroon tayo, linatagan natin ng facts and naintindihan po ng, may nung nagtanong kung ano po yung rason kung bakit siya tinuturing na hero uh, sa kabila ng ganito. So, he is not hiding. He is talagang nag, ano siya, na gumagawa ng mga paraan para um, masugpo Amen. yung mga mga ang kanyang mga kalaban during that time talaga na. So yun po, another question po is how is Simeon Ola remembered today by the people, especially in his hometown in Ginobata? Well, one thing, Joanne, is of course they put up a monument on him. They are celebrating his uh, uh, his birthday. His, uh, they commemorate his death anniversary. Uh, not only in his own town, but in the province already. So um, there was, um, you might say, a recognition of Ola's role, although controversial, even his surrender. But today, it's already it was already a given fact and already accepted by the people. And they're no longer concerned about the reason why he went up to the hills, went back to the hills after 1901 surrender. It's more of what he has already done 
uh, as, a, as a, one giving pride to the Filipinos that here's a guy who fought the Americans who in a way embarrassed Americans by the, <laughs> the pride of being superior force and all these things. And the, I think also, though, and you have to consider also, I was looking at the records, of any available records um, that seem to indicate that Ola committed a certain kind of atrocities and abuses. Apparently, was not. But the description of Mr. Pai that Ola was a very jolly guy, a very, very friendly guy, very, very kind guy. So I think we have to bank our trust on Ola, on, uh, on the testimony of these people regarding Ola as a good natured fellow. And probably in that particular respect, being an officer to command a large force of, who, were, who were frightening the Americans with his um, bravery, you know, and yet could not commit a crime in which it would associate even some kind of a stealing certain properties of people. Ola did not have that. Apparently, Ola remained poor in a way, um, knowing that eventually the, the descendants of Ola they did not become rich. And that in uh, it's something already we can say as an achievement of Ola as a, as, a, as a person whom young people could emulate, could honor, and to, to model themselves from. So talagang nagsilbi itong si um, Ola sa mga kababayan niya. At the same time, is talagang masasabi naman natin na at the moment is talagang patuloy pa rin kinukomemerate itong ating uh, mi, uh, si Simeon Ola ng mga taga-ginobatan. Ayan sir. A last question po from Leonardo Christopher E. e. Duarte. Uh, what is the lesson we can get from the life of General Ola? One thing is, here is a guy who's an ordinary guy. He was not famous. He was not, at the time that he joined the army, the revolution, was an ordinary guy. He was not even exceptional uh, intellectually. Um, in terms of social standing, he was not prominent. Uh, they were not wealthy, as I said, most probably belonging to the middle class. And yet, when the summon to serve, all uh, readily give up his life. And I think that's a mark of a hero. A hero is one who sacrifices without any uh, thought uh, of receiving compensation, um, rewards, or benefit after a while. Uh, and that's, I think, for me, that's enough already uh, as an example for the young people to follow. Secondly, he did not take advantage of his fame. He did not take advantage of his position. He did not take advantage of, his, of, his, uh, of what he had accomplished to even uh, look for a certain position in the colonial government. As you notice, Ola did not occupy uh, an, an, a place in the Ameri early American bureaucracy. He simply remained an ordinary person when he could have probably asked, uh, instead probably if, if there is a certain, uh, a certain question about the concessions given by the Americans to Ola, uh, having appointing of uh, Ola demanding that his friend Ramon Santos, the appointed governor of his uncle, he could have asked himself, okay, appoint me, pardon uh, my, uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, my crime, and at the same time, give me a position in the colonial government after a while. He, Ola did not ask that. He remained an ordinary guy after that. And I think this is an example of a true leader. And I think at this time when we are engaged in these uh, uh, elections today, I think we Filipinos should remember that that this guy is a man who could have asked for more, yet did not. He had given more, but asked for nothing in between. And I think that is the reason. That is a good example for our young people to follow. Thank you, sir. Maraming salamat po dun. At uh, that is a very good tribute or a personality na dapat meron tayo ngayon. So we remain simple as a youth and then young leaders that we have today. So kung ano yung meron tayo, pagbungahin natin and pag, mas pagyamanin natin and we must contribute to our community para talaga sabay-sabay sabay -sabay po tayo nga angat as uh, community sa uh, Philippines. Yan, maraming salamat po Sir Danny Hirona. Yan po ang lahat ng ating mga katanungan. At kung may mga katanungan pa po ang ating mga uh, manunood sa ating live F webinar ngayon ay isan lamang po ito sa ating FB pages ng mga, ng mga museo na kung saan po kayo nanonood. At pwede po natin isend kay Dr. Um, Herona. Okay, so with no further ado, I want to read po the 
Certificate of Appreciation by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, uh, Manila. The Certificate of Appreciation is given to Dr. Danilo M. Herona, Director of Center for Partido Study, Studies, Partido State University, for his individual contribution as resource speaker in the webinar titled, General Ola, the Last Filipino General of the Philippines Ameri Philippine American War Webinar, held on February 14, 2022, via Facebook page of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Jose Nejesi Robredo. Under signed by Carminda R. Arevalo, Officer in Charge, Office of the Executive Director of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Once again, sir, maraming salamat po. Diyos mabalos, mag-irilingan po kita o magkita po tayo ulit sa mga susunod na webinar na Museo ni Jesse Robredo at ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Diyos mabalos po, sir. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. So I hope that our uh, I hope that we learn a lot through our webinar. We would like to remind our participant to accomplish the evaluation form in the comment section of our Facebook Live to receive the digital certificate of the participation. Before we conclude our program today, we would like to thank some people who made this lecture possible. First, we want to thank. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Hirona, for the time and knowledge she shared with us today. And we also thank the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, led by the OIC Executive Director, Carminda Arevalo, and Chairman, Dr. Rene R. Escalante. Our Chief of the Historic Site Education Division, Ms. Gina Batuhan. Supervising HSDO, Mr. Brian Anthony Paraiso. Dep Ed Central and to our colleagues. And please check the Museo Ni Jesse Robredo uh, FB page, YouTube channel, and Spotify for audio webinar that you can listen on our podcast. And please check also the National Historical Commission of the Philippines 27 Museum for more activities. Again, thank you very much. Keep safe, everyone. A happy Valentine's Day and have a good day.